and welcome back. Now today I've got a very strong longing for something remote controlled or at least communicated via remote control. So I'm looking at um, an RFID reader, um, a Wemos Wi-Fi board, which I've had for so long that they've actually brought out a new revision for this now. This is the R1 and there's an R2. I'm not quite sure what the differences are yet, but I'll be looking into that. Basically, this is a, an Arduino type board. It hasn't got um, an AVR chip on it at all. It's got the ESP8266 chip, but it's Arduino sized and it's got some pins that are sort of relevant to Arduino as well but it's, it's quite a different board in that sense, but you can still compile to it and everything else uh, once you've installed all the relevant drivers. I'll be looking at that. Um, while I was doing that, um, I also got a couple of other ESP8266 bits. Now, this, this one, let's get the right bits together. This is a, a module that's quite commonly used in Arduinos. Um, it's just the, the chip itself that you're supposed to then solder on here like that, I believe. So you're supposed to place this on here, line it all up, and then just solder it on like that. And then put your pins in here and attach to it. Uh, but then I just happened to spot um, this little board, which was very cheap. And as I say, it caters for lots of ESP modules. Look, and this is, I think this is a 12E. Anyway, this, this solders in there just the same way as the other one, same similar fashion. But then they give you, I mean, all the pins come out down the bottom, and they give you this uh, right angled header that you put into there and solder up. And then that can plug into your breadboard or whatever for playing about with. And I think, no, that'd be ideal for what I want. And when we know it's all working and everything else, I can just get another one of these modules and perhaps solder it onto the original and then use that in a project. Now, the reason I got that is because I realized after a while that this wasn't particularly standard. And I've had this now for several months and the minute I got it, I fired it up, turned it into a server, um, connected it to um, a time computer. What do they call it, an NTC is it? Anyway, to see if it would work, I did the, um, the absolutely essential turn an LED off and on via a web browser on this and that all worked just absolutely fine. And that was all on Christmas Eve that I did that. Then I just put it to one side and faffed about with a few more bits and then forgot about it. So I think I'm, I'm tempted to get this out and try it once I've had a look at what the difference is between the R1 and the R2. Because everybody on the Arduino forum loves to do things with remote control or Wi-Fi or something like that. So this would be ideal. Uh, I'm also very tempted to get this RFID reader running. And there's just a couple of other... Th oh, yes. One thing you have to know about this RFID reader. This is a, a MyFair type reader. Now, this is a... Oh, it doesn't actually tell me the frequency. I know it's um, several megahertz, though. It's, just, it's the fixed standard um, frequency that we use for all um, RFIDs. In fact, there are three frequencies for RFIDs. There's the low frequency, which is something like, I think it's around about 135 kilohertz. And that's used, I don't know, in industrial applications. This one though is a 13.56 megahertz. And that's just about every card you're gonna get in a, in a hobbyist type realm. And then they do another one for RFIDs. It's, um, ultra high frequency and it's something like 850 to 960 megahertz. Now the ultra high frequency ones have a massive advantage over, over this one in as much that the range is much bigger. So whereas the range on here you can probably think well if you get it to within about two centimeters something like that. But the UHF one it says the the range, unlike this one, which is about a couple of centimetres or thereabouts, so if the, here's the fob, you can get that within about there and I'll read it. Um, we've used these at work, in fact, we're given cards just like this and we have to swipe in against something. Some of them you have to go right up to and almost touch. Obviously they're in a plastic housing, but you still have to, you know, touch them more or less like that. And there's a couple, you can go about that far away, but that's about it. Now the ultra high frequency ones can work a metre or more away. 
and I'm guessing they're the ones they use in um, places like well there's a Costco warehouse near where I live and at Christmas when things get really really busy they take a trader's trolley and just run this huge scanner over it and it just picks up everything but they're, they're not doing it you know within a couple of centimeters they're doing it well from at least 30 centimeters a foot away probably double that in fact and then just giving them the bill at the end of it so it obviously reads every single RFID tag on the trolley which is amazing but I guess it's not ready for mainstream supermarket use just yet anyway we won't be concentrating on the ultra high frequency one because I couldn't possibly afford to buy one and they're not generally available to hobbyists so we'll concentrate on this ubiquitous one and just get this set up but what I was going to say is that these this is a 3.3 board and you can't therefore use that with a standard Uno without doing something to adjust the levels. Now luckily, in my little kit, I've got these um, level adjusters. There's this one here. Does it say anything? No, but it is a, it's a level adjuster. Now this one here, I have another one somewhere. Here we are. There's this one as well. One of these, possibly both, is bi-directional. So it's 3.3 in one end, 5 volts out the other, and the signals can go both ways. Whether it's this one here, or this one here, I'm not sure. I'm going to have to look it up to see where I bought it from. Uh, the other one, whichever one it is, is just a single direction. Now, the thing about RFID readers, of course, is that not only do you want to read RFIDs from the fobs and cards, ideally, you want to write to them as well, so that if they're compromised, you can uh, change it. So I want to get this working so it reads and writes to this fob. Um, let's hope we don't make any mistakes because I've only got one fob. Normally these come in packs of like five or something. But uh, this was particularly cheap on eBay, so I've just snaffled the one. Well, we've got two really. Well, we've got a card and a fob. So we got two. Okay, what else? There's one other little thing. Um, if anybody's been following my um, load cell coffee coaster, which is this thing here which you'll recognize and it's uh, oh, flashing away still um, now the day after I finished my last video the ultra bright uh, LEDs arrived look so I've got red yellow hyper bright and super bright I think they were red and yellow so one of these is going to find its way into here and I'll do all that over the next I don't know two three months <laughs> sorry days and uh, get back to you um, the other thing that uh, I found, if you notice, look, this cable has got this sort of magnetic thing on here. Here's a spare one. So you, I bought this uh, from Banggood as a sort of way of maintaining your cables. You unclip this bit here. Oh, it's quite tight. There we are. So you open that up, clamp your cable in there. Now it's got this sort of star mechanism, so I guess you could clamp it in any direction. But, well, I've only clamped it straight up. So you clamp your cable in there, that's a magnet, and then that fits on a little magnetic um, sticky device that I've got, which you won't be able to see very well. Um, it's actually under there, it's that blue line, this thing here, the individual little magnets, once they're attached to a cable, just stick under here to hold your cables securely. So if I can demonstrate with the one that I did have plugged into my coffee cup. So that goes under there like that. Just sort of hangs on there. Just keeps them off the desk and out the way. Um, the other thing, if you can just see at the back there, I might be able to zoom in a little tiny bit. That, that is also a cable management system. It's a little bit messy at the minute. But the idea is that uh, your cables, if you didn't have the magnetic ones, go through there and then as they fall back, which this one's absolutely refusing to do now, of course, it gets stopped by the actual plug itself. Now this one's being stopped by the magnet, but um, this plug, this is a, a micro, still doesn't fit through this little tiny slot. So that keeps the cables from disappearing down the back of my desk, which I found pretty useful. I've got two of those, one at each end. Very difficult to film though, because obviously the camera's on a, on a movable tripod, not free ranging. Um, so that's on Banggood. I'll drop in a picture. Well, first of all, I'm going to have a sip of my uh, Saturday afternoon Zinfandel wine. Thank you very much. Hmm. Dry mouth, that's what it is. That's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. 
Right, I'm going to um, look up the difference between V1 and V2. And as I've already got a sketch for this, uh, which we might have better so let's go into my code window. Oh, well, you got it twice there now because I think one's the um, debug window. We'll come to that. And uh, then we'll see about the V1 and V2 changes. After all, you would expect there to be some improvements, otherwise there wouldn't be any need for a V2. One thing I did read, I think, on the WeMOS forum is that um, the pin arrangement is different, which I don't know strikes me as particularly bizarre. Because if there are any, if you've managed to generate some sort of shield for this one, then you couldn't use it on the next one, which is oh, a recipe for disaster, isn't it? Let's get that WeMOS D1 Wi-Fi module loaded up and have a look at uh, some very simple code again. And we're back. Now, the last board that I was going on about was this one here. And I was going, this board D1 this and this board D1 that. It's only when I looked at the video afterwards, I suddenly thought, oh, poo, that wasn't a D1, that was an ESP Duino. I mean, it says it big enough on there. I was actually referring to this board here, which is a D1 Wi-Fi. And this is the release one of which there now is um, a release two, so this is superseded, but not, not enough to make us worry about what's going on here. So I'm gonna show you both really, because the D1R2 is actually reasonably well thought of in the WeMOS community. Um, and the ESP Duino, frankly, looks well, almost like a clone, sort of, not quite, it's not quite a clone. These pins you see across the top here are close, but not the same as this. And the pins as specified on here are most definitely not what you might expect. It's not like the Uno. Um, in fact, if you turn it upside down, that way around, um, you can see the GPIO pins here. And there's um, a sort of a translation required to translate those into these top ones and find out exactly which pin is working. So you've got only a limited number of pins on any um, WeMOS type board, this one and that one. Specifically, you've only got one analog, look, A0, same as that one there. That's only got um, A0, and the other one says NC, not connected. Well, okay, well, that's not a concern for me at the moment. Um, the other thing is, this is a 3.3 board. So this could, in fact, connect quite happily to that uh, that um, RFID fob that I mentioned, that was 3.3 volts, but I won't. I mean, I'm just mentioning it as a bit of interest. Don't connect up any 5 volt peripherals to this. But it's not peripherals we're interested in, really. What we really want is um, to get this thing installed and uh, running. So it was fun and games, really, getting the, um, the D1 and the ESP Duino sorted out. But luckily for you, I've got all the links and everything. I'm going to put all this in the comments below this video okay so if you're watching it now it's somewhere below this video here in the comments or in the information section and there'll be some links to the pdfs that you'll probably need and the library so i've got all that so if we look at the browser window there we are um, so this is the installation of the esp do we know so that's um that's this one here Okay, and that's, um, it, it's fairly straightforward. I mean, I did have the Chinese one to begin with, so that was real fun and games, but I've managed to dig out this uh, English one. That's the 10th of January 2016, so you can say it's, um, you know, it's, it's a current board. Um, everything was fine. I mean, the drivers for the three uh, CH340 um, serial port were already there. And it says the first thing, oh, now you need to know this. This is the... Um, these are the parameters you need to select in the tools for the board. We'll go into that in just a sec. Uh, look at this, just look, flash size, four megabytes, megabytes. I'll say that again slowly. The flash on this board is four megabytes. Now, just before you get too excited, you'll see that the Blink program, which is probably about 20 bytes, I suppose, in real terms, actually takes up about 200K. However, that notwithstanding, this is still one huge leap up. And also, of course, look at this bit here, 80 megahertz processor. So it really is a much more powerful board than the Uno. 
Okay, well it tells you a few things about how to upload things and it says put the Blink program on. So, well let's try that first of all then. Whether it's the ESP Duino or the D1, I mean it's pretty much the same. So let's go on to our code window. Now this is my big Wi-Fi thing, but I don't want to do that first of all. So this is the code window for the Blink, which is pretty tiny. What we're going to do now is go to the boards, tools, there's the board that we need to select, but I'll show you where it is. So in here, look, it says ESP Duino, ESP13 module. Now ESP modules have increased over the years, so just make sure you pick the right one. Now, a little bit lower down, you'll see, here we are, look, Wemos D1 retired. That's the other one I've got. Uh, the R2 is now the preferred one but I haven't got an R2 so we won't go into that and we're going to do it on the ESP Duino model, module because that's what I just happen to have um, it's 80 megahertz oh look it could go up to 160 well some variants but we're using 80 flash size 4 megabytes I don't know what the 3M SP IFFS stands for but the only other option is the 1 meg don't know anyway it's 4 meg upload speed 115k well 0.2k and the port is, of course, depending on your machine. Over, there we are. So as you can see, I've got a number of things attached at the moment. That one there, where it says um, COM16, and that's the disabled port. Remember, for my video switching touch sensor, CAT118, so that's working. Um, the COM18 is the one we're looking at at the moment for the blink. And the COM5, that's in fact my Wemos D1, also attached now waiting for us to use, but that's in a little while. Right, thank you very much. So, now it says, this is where the fun and game lies. Let's go back to the code window again. Now what it says is, for this board in that PDF, which you've probably downloaded by now, I hope, it says, to upload here, you, there are two buttons there. One says RST, and one says Flash. And what you've got to do, um, you can see there are lights on here at the minute, I'm not quite sure what the lights mean, but uh, we have to hold down the flash button and the reset button for six seconds. So flash first, it says. So hold down flash. Now the reset. Oh, so something happened there. Look, It says for six seconds. And now you can upload. Well, okay, it's about six seconds. Let's have a go. Just his warning. Mm, okay. Well, we'll soon know if it's worked or not when the uploading here is finished. Because all we're going to get is a blinking LED we hope done uploading it says fine what's that LED doing oh there it goes yes I think that is the standard blink frequency isn't it one second on one second off okay so what we've established now is that the boards themselves both this one and the D1 have all been installed correctly so now we can actually do something more meaningful with it so I want to go back to the D1 now because that's what I've, I know is going to work uh, and have a look at the other code that I have built I don't know, a few months back now. So let me just find that code. This is the Wi-Fi. So that's that one. Now as you can see, I've already uploaded it once just to make sure it's still working. In fact, I think it probably was on this board anyway because I've got nothing else to test with it. Um, so what about this code then? Well, basically, you have to include this library. But that happened automatically. Once I'd installed the boards via the board manager, so if we look at File, Preferences. Now, this, is, this place here is where you specify additional boards. So you click on this little button here, and you type them in one line at a time or paste them in because most of these sites give you the code so this first one you can uh, forget this is all about spark fun balls which I've been doing some work on and if you've watched any of my previous videos you would have seen that I've been using the spark fun boards but this is the one here look this is the interesting one so it's Arduino ESP8266.com stable package ESP8266.com index JSON so that's what you'll find and I'll put a link down below where you can find all this so having got that in here, you can then go to Tools, Board, 
uh, if you go right to the top, Boards Manager. Now in here, what this is now doing is downloading all the descriptions of the boards that you could possibly install. Now, of course, Arduino boards, as you can see here, is already installed. But if we go a bit further down, there we are, ESP8266 by the ESP8266 community. That's installed because I've already done it. But you could install a different version or remove it. Well, on me, on my, on my machine here, that said install. So I did, and lo and behold, it installed. And then this library magically was available. So I haven't even looked to see whether it's put it into the libraries or where, it, where it's put it or whether it's a different place, but it worked. Now that's my SSID. RSB, which is obviously RSB, play on my name. And this code here, basically what it's saying is go and connect to the Wi-Fi that you've specified. And you'll excuse me if I don't actually show you my password for that. Who knows who could be listening in. Uh, let me go back to the code window. I think it's slightly easier. There we are. All right, so we say go and connect to that um, SSID, so what this is what this is doing, while it's not connecting, it'll print a dot, and it says I'm connected. This is all standard code that I'm guessing, I've obviously taken from the internet somewhere, perhaps it was the same website where it had this library, uh, but I'll put a link to all this as well so you can play without it. It then comes back and says, because I'm connecting as a server, which I think I've specified somewhere, here we are, Wi-Fi server here. That's what determines whether it's a server or a client. So basically this board is going to give out web pages. So you connect to it from your browser to it and it will serve up web pages. A bit clunky, but it works. So having got itself a server address from your Wi-Fi, it then displays what that is so you know how to connect. And then this bit here, I'm not going to go into it all, basically turns on the built-in LED. See that LED, blue LED there? Well, blue white to you on the camera. That's the one that's going to go on and off according to this. Now, as you can see, these, these print lines, client dot print line, these are quite important, especially this one here. It even mentions it. Don't forget that blank line after you've given out the header. This header here. So you must have that. That's why I've left it all in. And there's a title. Okay, there's a style. I've probably changed some of this since it came down. As uh, that's what I do for a living, creating web pages. So I just made it slightly easier. And then you click uh, a button on the page. Let's fire this up on the browser so that you get an idea of what's happening. As you can see, I've um, somehow it's changed the uh, the com port here. It was com18 quite happily, and then. It decided no COM18 wasn't up. I think it's because I've had two code windows open at the same time, both connected to COM18, and things get terribly convoluted. You wouldn't normally do that when you're doing it as part of this sort of video, really. Right, so I've got COM18 debug window open now, and I'm hoping that's actually going to display something when I reset this. Oh, there we are. Now it's connecting to my Wi-Fi. Oh, look at that. Look, that was quick. So now it's saying this is the address to use to connect to this board. So this is now waiting for me to connect via my browser. So let's switch back to the browser window and actually try that. So that's 192.168.2.12. I'm pretty sure I've used that before. 12. There we are. So we've, we're on. We've connected. So we're seeing everything now. So here's the browser connected. And this here is the debug window from that. And as you can see, as we connected, it says, oh, look, we connected and didn't do anything, and now we're here. Right, so now I've um, got my camera pointed at this. What, we should, what we're hoping is that this LED here, um, which isn't pin 13, by the way, so that's why you've got to be really careful when you're looking at the code. It says built-in LED. Right, so here we are. Now, as soon as I opened up the browser, we start getting messages here about a new client. It does its stuff, waits for something, and then says client disconnected. So if I, the LED is on at the moment. I'll just bring that really close. You can see that's on. So if I come up here and say off, there we are, off it is. And then it just waits. Now we have to click again, 
on again. Now you might say, well, hang on a minute, you're connected by this USB to your computer. I mean, how about freestanding? Well, yes, I thought of that. So what I've got here is my power pack. This is a, a kit from one of my video tutorials here. So this is a standalone um, 18650 rechargeable pack. So what we're going to do is disconnect that. Now, so of course, as soon as I disconnect this, we will not get any more information on here because obviously we're not connected anymore. But we can still see the browser window. So let's flip over to the browser. We'll disconnect this and connect it to the power station. Right, power station is on 93% as you can see, right. So we're now connected. Well, we hope we're connected. The LED light is on and I'm now gonna say, turn it off. And lo and behold, and you saw there, the page refreshed and this said off. So if we click the on again, on and the page refreshed slightly slowly and on it says. Now that is about as simple as you can get with Wi-Fi. So this is a standalone board now connected only to, to this power pack, not to my computer. So it's just sitting there waiting for commands. It says, well, I'm a server. I'm on this address come and connect to me. And of course, what happens when you do connect? Well, that's entirely up to you. But the fact you we've managed to turn this LED on and off, which is quite fascinating, isn't it? Turn it on. Oh, I think we've lost the connection. I think I've played about too much. Oh dear, a disaster. You know why? The LED is off because my power bank decided to switch off. Perhaps I pressed a button or something. Right, let's turn that back on. Is that the on button? Yes. Right, okay, we're back in business. We're on. This is initializing, so I'm hoping just by sending that, frankly, it should turn it off, shouldn't it? So let's send that. Oh, the light went off, the page is refreshed, and we're back in business. So now let's turn it back on. There we are, it's on. And the page refreshes. Now when I say the page refreshes, what it means is of course, is that this is sending out information to your browser, right? That your browser then interprets as this web page, as the commands to display something on the screen. Now, if you're not familiar with HTML, uh, here's your chance to sort of get involved a little bit and just do some simple things because you don't need a lot of HTML to turn a few things on or off on here and or to read the value. So it would be useful to look at the code. So let's whiz back to the code window and just have a quick look. So the bit I wanted to show you, quite frankly, was a little bit further down. Having connected and it tells us all the IP address. So in the loop here, we're saying, look, have we, are we connected or not? And we assume we are. Now it's waiting until we send some data. That's us pressing the send button and saying, I'm sending you something down the line via Wi-Fi. So it reads it until we get the slash R, which is uh, carriage return. That's return. T is tab. What else you got? I don't know. Flush means just flush that buffer. Make sure there's nothing stuck in that buffer. Now, what we're reading here is we're reading the actual URL coming in. So I'm saying on that request, and this is a very quick and dirty way of doing it, but it serves our purpose. Can I see slash LED equals on? If we go just look at the uh, browser for a sec, you'll see what I mean. It's this bit up the top here. You see, you see this bit here? So it's looking for everything after the address to say, is it on or is it off? Now, instead of clicking these pins, I could quite easily. Right, so we're gonna say off. Now I'm gonna hit return. So this is on at the minute, so I'm not clicking a button, I'm just sending that, that string, this string here, down the line. And as you saw there, it's gone off and it's refreshed the page. So back to the code window. So it's looking at that um, parameter, I suppose you could call it, on in the code window. Looking for parameter and just setting the LED high. And ditto, if it's off, and it sets it off. 
Um, and of course it then does write the correct value to the LED pin. Um, now, just a word of warning, all ESP boards have got a reverse output. So when we want um, the LED on, we have to say, well, what I'm doing here is saying, set it to the value it's not currently set because it should be set here to a low value. And ditto, when, we're, when it's off, which would normally set it to a low value, and as you see, I've been playing about, really, we've got to set it to a high value because high is off and low is on. But here I'm just saying, set it to whatever value it isn't at the moment. Now, to serve up that page with just a couple of lines, this is what the HTML language looks like. Play about with this by all means, but some things you do need, like that blank line. After the header, it's just a convention of HTTP protocol. Um, what else? Okay, these, this is the, um, the little links you can click on that page. It's an uh, anchor, that's what an A is. Perhaps we'll go into some HTML programming a little bit later on when I've figured out a use for this. And then finally it says, I'm disconnected. Right, there we are. So that's, that's um, a D1. The ESP Duino works the same way, but I've got to upload for this yet, and it's, it's trickier with these pins, but I'm definitely going to do that. Um, next step will be to get this module here soldered up so we can play about on the breadboard a bit more uh, with the standard UNO rather than one of these boards so that your UNO can then connect to one of these and send some data across the airwaves. So that's for a future project, but in the meantime this gives you a flavour of what to do and it's getting the setup correct that's probably the biggest hurdle but I'll put as much information as I can in the video down below the links to how to set it up the boards and anything else I can find it took, probably took me I don't know an hour in total to get my D1 sorted out and then this one as well but for you it should probably take about 15 minutes with the correct documentation to hand so I'm going to do that for you and Thanks for watching, see you in the next video. I hope you're finding these videos interesting and useful. You can leave comments down below and also click that little button that says subscribe. Okay, thanks for watching and see you in the next video.